Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are well. We would like to welcome you on behalf of our Human Oncology Pathogenesis Program. Our good afternoon, Bianca, thank you. So we will, um, we are so excited to kick off our summer research seminar series. And today we have uh, the pleasure of having Dr. Ross Levine as our first speaker, where he will be discussing the fundamentals of cancer biology. Just to give you a brief overview of Dr. Levine's history. So he serves currently as the Lawrence Joseph Dinan Chair in Leukemia Research of, and Chief of the Molecular Cancer Medicine Service in Hobbs. He's also a physician scientist where he focuses on researching and treating blood and bone marrow cancers, including acute myeloid leukemia and the chronic myeloproliferative neoplasm, polycythemia vera essential thrombocytosis and primary myelofibrosis. Um, and again, a couple of things before he begins. For those that will submit questions, there is a Q&A feature here. We ask that you type in your questions and we will answer them accordingly. In addition, for those questions that we are unable to answer, we will send them to Dr. Levine and um, he will be answering them on his Twitter account as well. Um, and to introduce myself before Dr. Levine begins, my name is Vicki Bowden. I serve as the project manager here in HOP, where I manage our summer student program. And we, I am very excited to have you all join us as we begin our seminar series. Thank you so much. And Dr. Levine, the floor is yours. I need to be able to share my screen. Someone's disabled screen sharing. Thanks. Okay. Great. Well, thanks everybody for spending an hour of your time with us and we really appreciate it. And we hope you'll enjoy uh, this series that Vicki and uh, everybody in the HOP program has put together and it's just a privilege to be able to spend that time with you today. And as you can see in the bottom of my intro slide, my Twitter handle is Ross Levine MD. So if I don't get to your questions or if you have questions, just please feel free to tweet them out um, and uh, I will answer them uh, whenever they come in. So before we talk about uh, cancer biology and genetics and a career as a physician scientist, I just remind everyone that we do live in interesting and challenging times, and we ask everybody uh, to stay safe, to wear a mask, socially distance. And we know it's really hard to be a student right now. It's hard to do homeschooling. It's hard because many of your summer plans were canceled or altered to online only. We know that your in-person connections are limited. Uh, we hear you, and we're here to support you, and that's really important to all of us. And we would encourage all of you to remember that it's more important to stay connected and engaged than achieving some specific thing that shows that you've accomplished uh, something for your uh, resume or CV. And just on a personal note, I'll remind you all that when I was a high school student, I didn't do summer research. I didn't work in a lab. I didn't take summer courses. I had regular jobs and went to camp. And so the good news that means is that you're all ahead of the curve by being here today. You're expressing and enriching your own interest in science. We think that's great. And you've got lots of time to figure this out. And please email, tweet, contact any of us anytime with your questions, not just about the science, but also about uh, the process and how it works. And so you can see the schedule here and it's online. Uh, there'll be lectures uh, roughly twice a week. And you can see we have another lecture later this week by Shang Kai and two lectures the following week and the week after and going all the way through mid-August. And then in the last uh, few weeks in August, it'll move to panel-based discussions, which I think are gonna be wonderful, an opportunity to hear from people to really talk about you know, what it's like to go into science as a career and the different both opportunities and challenges and how they've met and uh, exceeded them. And I think it will be incredibly uh, wonderful to hear from all of my colleagues. 
So before I talk about science, I thought I'd maybe give a little bit of biographical uh, information just to give you guys some perspective of how I became a scientist and a doctor. Um, as a high school student, I knew that I liked math and science, but I had done very little um, formal training outside of classwork. Um, I did, uh, as an undergrad, major in biology. I did not work in a lab as an undergrad even. I did some clinical research, and that was only because there was a flyer on the wall in the bio labs, and they had a job. Um, and really went to medical school thinking I would be a, a scientist, uh, not really, but rather a doctor. And it was only my first year in medical school when I was just going around asking advice, and I happened to have met somebody who was a acquaintance of my father's from college, and I just asked him what did he think was the right path to go down. I was asking advice, and he said that science was the answer in the future, and he was not a scientist, and I thought that really impacted me. And so I decided to spend a summer, my first summer in medical school. So my first laboratory experience was at the age of uh, 22, and I mostly uh, broke uh, sequencing plates in the lab, and ultimately by the end of the summer made some uh, very small discoveries, and that really was uh, amazing event for me to see that science can work and that I could have an impact was absolutely uh, tremendous. And I kept coming back to the lab after that and wanting to do more and more. And it was cancer research, not because I wanted to study cancer, but because that was the opportunity that I had. And it was really the science that drew me into cancer as a field. I then ended up spending a year in medical school, taking a gap year between my third and fourth year doing research. And then I went back to medical school and did my medical school, my clinical training, my chemonk training, but I missed the lab. I missed it greatly. And I started my career as a um, physician scientist now 13 uh, years ago. And I can tell you that I really uh, greatly enjoy what I do. I spend 80 or 90% of my time doing uh, laboratory research. And I spend about a month a year taking care of patients in the hospital across the street. And I wouldn't have it any other way. And why do I think it's so amazing to be a cancer scientist and a clinician? The first is that we have a greater understanding of cancer as a discipline that, than most other diseases. And I think there are so many great research questions that it's been a great area to study. There's a long track record of laboratory discoveries having an impact on cancer patients. And insights from the cancer medicine uh, clinical context informing science. You see a patient and you say, boy, that's a really interesting question. It's both rewarding and challenging to care of cancer patients. As I think you all know, you know, cancer is a hard disease to have. It's a hard disease to see your family members suffer. And it's a hard disease to be a doctor, nurse, or other care provider. But that's our inspiration, our motivation, is the challenges that our patients go through. And I think our hope is that we take this observation of clinical medicine, and it inspires us to have an impact in the lab, and then we have this cycle back and forth. And it's our hope that this is not unique to cancer. We're seeing similar impact in other diseases, and I think even in uh, COVID-19, which is obviously the existential moment we're in now, we're seeing a lot of amazing opportunities for clinicians who are in the, in the hospital making observations that go back to the lab and inform discovery and back. And that's why I do uh, what I do. So let's turn to cancer as a disease and as a scientific problem where we'll spend uh, the bulk of our time. Uh, to remind you all, cancer is the second uh, leading cause of mortality in the US, at least in the non-COVID uh, perspective, and it is approaching that of um, heart disease. And if you look, unlike heart disease, where the incidence of mortality has gone down dramatically, this is a logarithmic scale. So as we've gotten better at lowering cholesterol and blood pressure and lifestyle modification, heart disease remains a major um, source of mortality, but much less so. And cancer is not dramatically changed. We're starting to see a little bit of a benefit, but it really is uh, now a major cause of mortality in the United States. And in both males and females, both with cases in the top and deaths in the bottom, you can see that it's a very uh, wide diversity of cancer types that cause a significant illness and uh, even death. And in males, uh, the most common cancers are prostate, lung, colon, and then bladder. And for deaths, it's uh, lung, prostate, colon, pancreas. And for females, it's breast, and then lung, colon, uh, uterine corpus. And then for deaths, lung, breast, colon, pancreas. And so that really 
I think illustrates the point that it's not one disease, but it's probably hundreds. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but I think that will be a theme that you get throughout all of these um, lectures. So what if we take a step back then and say, okay, cancer is a bad disease. It's a set of diseases. Are there concepts or are there biological features of cancer cells that are distinct from normal cells? Are there barriers or things that cancers have to overcome to become cancer cells. And this slide, better than any slide I've seen from Doug Annan and Bob Weinberg, summarizes at least some of the classical traits that we believe that cancer cells have to um, solve. And that includes um, growing without stopping growing, ignoring signals telling them not to grow, avoiding the immune system. I won't talk a lot about the immune system today, but you're going to hear a lot about that in the next two months. You know, the challenge of your telomeres, which some of you may know, you know, that chromosomes have ends, and if you divide too much, they can actually shrink and keeping them alive. Um, inflammation, the ability to spread outside of its initial site, grow blood vessels to feed, genomic instability, resisting cell death, energetics. These are all things that a cancer cell or set of cells need to solve. And that is a fundamental question in cancer biology and genetics. And so, the other sort of broad concept I want to really get at is the idea that cancer may be lumped together as a disease, but it's really a heterogeneous group of diseases. There are many different manifestations of cancer that cause morbidity and mortality. It can differ based on the cancer type, the patient, and many factors, some of which we don't understand. And so why does cancer create problems for patients? The first is that the organ system where it originates can fail. The classical example is hepatocellular or liver cancer, where often the liver becomes sort of taken over and there's no longer normal liver function. And that could be a source of death, unfortunately, for liver cancer patients. The second, probably even more common challenge is metastasis, which is when cancer leaves the site it starts and travels throughout the body. It often does that in many different places at once, brain, lungs, liver. It's more common in solid tumors than blood based cancers, which is what I study. And it really can make people ill and be a major cause of death. Cancer cells can crowd out, obstruct, or interfere with normal functions. They can block the GI tract. They can block kidney draining. They can crowd out the bone marrow so normal blood cells can't work. They can secrete factors that lead to systemic side effects like fevers or myalgias or inability to eat or sort of cachexia. And cancer providers, health providers, need to care for not the tumor or the tumor type, but the patient. And one of the reasons I became a cancer doctor was that I didn't want to study a particular system. And I didn't want to only be an expert in the GI system or the lung or the brain. I wanted to care for a patient. And for me, oncology was the combination of having specific knowledge in a particular area in concert with really being the patient's doctor for all the different things that they're dealing with. And that really um, appealed to me as a doctor. But the other thing we need to think about that is not only what are the things that a cancer needs to solve to become a cancer and how does it make people sick, but, how, but rather what are the biological factors that allow that to occur? And at a fundamental level, we have to think of cancer as a genetic disease. And I think it's important to understand that that does not mean that all cancers or even most cancers are heritable. Most cancers are not genetic in the sense that they're passed down from one family member to another. There's a minority of cases that are what we would call familial. The majority of cancers are caused by changes in their DNA that are specific to cells that acquire those changes after birth. We call that in um, cancer lexicon a sporadic disease, that it's one cell after birth that gets a change in its DNA, and then there's accumulation of all of those different events, and then that cell is now different, or that clone, than all the other cells. And those can grow, lead to um, growth signals that are unremitting, uh, oncogenes, or disable um, signals that tell a cell not to grow. So think of cancer as a cell that changed its blueprint. Now the gas pedal is used or stuck down, or the brake is disabled, or both. And that allows cancer cells now, in a way that they don't respond to normal cues, to overtake their environment and all of the normal cells. And that's the fundamental thing that makes cancer different than many other cells. 
And to understand that, you need to understand then the genetic blueprint of cells. And I know for some of you, you may have had this background in high school biology, but I really want to take a step back and explain molecular biology and how it applies to cancer, because it will help us as we get um, back to cancer genetics. I'll remind you all that the central dogma of cancer or of molecular biology is that DNA is the blueprint, the nucleus of every cell, and that through transcription, you make RNA, and through translation, you make protein. And that process is highly regulated and has tremendous fidelity. And in fact, errors are carefully um, regulated. We know that DNA is an exquisite double helix of complementary base pairs. There are only four bases in DNA, three billion base pairs. And every time a cell divides, you have to re replicate the whole thing. So there's tremendous, um, machinery in a cell to keep the DNA replicated with tremendous accuracy and fidelity. But even if it's 99.999% ac accurate, imagine if one in, in a billion makes a mistake. That would mean that every cell would have three errors. Most of those errors are innocuous or negative. But imagine if one of those errors gives that one cell an advantage. And so we think the fundamental thing that leads to mutations in cancer is not necessarily chemical exposures, but rather just the inherent level of mutagenesis with cell division. And the best predictor for cancer rates is the rate of cell division. It's not that simple. You can layer lots of interesting complexity on top of it, but this is the main driving force. And then if you look from DNA to RNA, you go and transcribe it, and only a small fraction of the genome goes from DNA to RNA. Those are the coding genes, 20, 25,000 of them, and only a fraction of that, maybe 1%. And this um, is transcribed, it's then spliced, or the introns are removed, and you only get the exons. And when we talk about studying the exome, we talk about studying the part of the DNA that only includes the exon. Whereas we talk about the genome, we talk about studying the whole thing. We're going to come back to that. And I'm not going to talk today about transcription and splicing, but it's become apparent to many scientists that this process can be corrupted during cancer as well. And it's a really exciting and interesting area in its own right. And we know if you go to DNA to RNA to protein, it, you have this tremendous um, exquisite genetic code where every three bases of DNA or RNA code a protein. And we know that it always starts with methionine and it's always in triplets. So what does that mean? Imagine if you delete one or two or four or seven base pairs of DNA through a mistake, you're going to end up out of frame. And then the rest of the protein is encoded wrong. And last, this process of what we call translation or converting RNA to protein can be actually altered in cancer and by drugs that we use to treat cancer, classically inhibitors of mTOR or the target of rapamycin. And so just a few minutes to talk about uh, definitions. And again, this I think is mostly to get us all on the same page. When we say somatic, we mean acquired, not present in birth. That would mean that a cancer cell is an alteration that's present in the cancer cell that wasn't present at birth. A synonymous versus a non-synonymous would be a DNA sequence change that does or does not change the amino acid. So synonymous would mean a change in the sequence, but doesn't change amino acid sequence. A non-synonymous would mean a change in amino acid sequence. A missense would be a single amino acid change, and a nonsense would be a change from an amino acid to a stop signal, and then the protein stops at that spot. And a frame shift would be that deletion of one, two, four, seven, where you're now out of um, frame. Copy number alterations, which we won't speak a lot today, I'll remind you all that with the exception of genes on X and Y, every gene in the genome should have two copies, but in cancer, many times you have more than two or less than two. Loss of heterozygosity would be, normally you have a maternal and a paternal copy of a gene, you now are all maternal, all paternal, and that can be either deletion or duplication. Translocations are when two chromosomes break and then fuse together abnormally. We'll talk about that. And that can lead to the formation of a fusion gene, and we will talk about that in a few minutes. And last but not least, the concept of aneuploidy, which is common in cancer, when many cancers not only have mutations and copy number gains, but rather have whole regions of chromosomes that are gained or lost will look nothing like a normal cell. An oncogene is a, is a gene that when it's mutated has increased functionality, so it promotes growth. A tumor suppressor is a gene that's like a break, where normally it's there to protect you against getting cancer, and then if you mutate and inactivate it, you end up um, promoting cancer. Haplin sufficient is a gene where you lose one copy, 
and then it contributes to cancer. And deletion would be a reduction in copy number and amplification is a gain. I'm sorry for going through all of that. I promise you the lecture is recorded. I'm happy to share these slides with anybody, but it, just to get us all um, up to speed. So how do we understand how cancer uh, develops? I would argue that probably the most important studies done in the history of cancer genetics were done by Bert Vogelstein, Ken Kinsler, and colleagues, where they took colorectal cancer and they sequenced everything from normal colonic epithelia to adenoma or polyps to early um, pre-invasive and invasive cancers to metastases. And what they showed is that there was a sequence of genetic events that were accumulated. And the reason that they could do this was that colon cancer and all of its precursor states are accessible via colonoscopy because everybody gets colonoscopy. But we don't have the same ability to ascertain that from every other cancer. And so we can't access all these pre-malignant lesions. You can't sample the pre-malignant pancreas or the bone marrow very easily. And so how do we understand how cancer develops if we don't have samples from every single stage? And so till recently, that's been really challenging. But most recently, we and others have begun to use single cell DNA sequencing. So imagine, instead of just detecting mutations in the whole tumor, if you could do it in every single cell. And now if every single cell has um, the ability to get mutations, you could actually put it back together. Imagine that you had a leukemia that had four mutations. And now you knew in every cell whether it had anywhere from zero to four of those mutations. You can now piece together the sequence of events from the population of cells. And that's what we did here. And so look here in this leukemia on the left, there are three different genes that are mutated, DNMT3A, oops, DNMT3A, IDH2, and NPM1. And in individual cells, you could see there's DNMT3A only cells, DNMT3A IDH double mutant cells, and then NPM1 on top of that. And that lets you determine that order of events in that patient. And then look at this patient on the right, where there's IDH, and then IDH and FLT3, IDH NPM1. The lesson here is that that patient has actually a complex ecosystem of different mutational combinations. And we have to think of cancer that way more and more. It's not an ordered set of events that's linear and linear only. It's genetic evolution occurring at all times. Like Darwin talked, you know, in the Galapagos about genetic variation. Cancer is a set of cells always undergoing genetic variation, some of which take and then gives fitness advantages, many of which don't. And then we can read out what are the different um, variants and sets of variants that evolve over time. And so we want to now say, okay, we can map all of the different genetic events. We want to understand how we can find those events. We want to understand how we can use those to develop therapies. And then we want to understand how we can use this to impact cancer care. And I am here to answer your questions now and after on uh, Twitter. So how do we find cancer genes? So the earliest way to do this was through families. There are unfortunately are families where everybody in the family is at risk of getting a cancer or even set of cancers. And this was how we found genes that were predisposing to retinoblastoma called the RB gene. Breast cancer, BRCA1 and 2. Many different malignancies, the P53 gene. And unfortunately, those same genes are involved in sporadic cancers. So not only if you inherit a P53 mutation does it give you a high risk of cancer, there are people that get P53 mutations in some of their cells after birth, and that drives cancer. We know that you can characterize chromosomal alterations or translocations, and then you could actually sequence specific genes of interest. And that could be based on the gene that you've spent your life studying, previous work, or even serendipity. Sometimes you find a cancer gene because you go look and you just land in the right place. And all of this is to map the genetic alterations. I want to also remind you that these mutations have to be studied in the lab. We need to know what they do, that they have a biological effect. So the first genetic event identified in any cancer was the bcr able gene rearrangement. If you know the history of this, it was first identified by Noel and Hungerford in the early 1960s and called the Philadelphia chromosome because they were in Philadelphia and they looked under the microscope and they saw that they were abnormal chromosome. They didn't know what it was and what it meant. Janet Rowley in 1973 reported that this was a fusion of 9 and 22 and then about 10 years later it was figured out that what happens is that 9 and 22 break, they fuse together, and then 
BCR from chromosome 9 fuses to ABL on chromosome 22. This leads to an abnormal fusion anchor protein. ABL is a kinase that phosphorylates downstream effectors, and BCR, think of it as molecular Velcro, that it provides um, an attachment for two BCR ABL genes that when they're next to each other, transactivate or activate each other. This leads, instead of normally able as a signal that's only turned on when you need to grow. Now you have it fused to BCR and it's stuck in the on position. And in fact, we know that if you put BCR able into cells, it activates signaling, we call that constitutively or always on. And if you put this in blood cells, it grow, they then grow over and over and over again. And if you engineer this in mice, you get a leukemia phenotype. And that really was the first example of studying a human fusion oncoprotein. The question was, can you treat it? And this really was one of these remarkable stories where in the 70s and 80s, people didn't believe that you could inhibit kinases, but it was really a series of investigators, including Brian Drucker, then at Dana Farmer in Oregon, Charles Sawyers, the chair of HOP, Moshe Talpaz and others who had the idea that you could treat BCR able mutant leukemia with a inhibitor of BCR able and Gleevec was the first of these. And in the lab, if you put Gleevec on leukemia cells, it kills them, but it does not kill normal cells. This led to a series of clinical trials that showed that Gleevec and all of the um, progeny of Gleevec are incredibly effective. This on the left is the randomized trial of Gleevec versus chemotherapy, which is much less effective and much more toxic. And this is the responses in the Gleevec arm versus the combination therapy arm. And that really was one of the most positive trials in history. And I was a um, fellow in oncology at the time, and this was the inspiration for why I became an oncologist. The idea that we could develop incredibly effective, safe, and scientifically um, uh, rationally designed therapies that target very specific genetic events in cancer. It was this idea that many of us went into um, the cancer field to do, and it opened the era of molecular targeted therapy for cancer. And I think the best um, data is really this slide on this graph on the right. This is the U.S. incidence of CML. And if you look below, it's the um, mortality in the entire population in the United States from CML. And you can see it's dropped more than 80%. This is not a trial. This is the population-based mortality from CML. So a single drug and its progeny essentially took a disease that was incurable and has made it, in most cases, eminently treatable and a lifetime disease. The one thing I want to leave you with, and I would encourage all of you when you're in the lab talking to your um, colleagues uh, when you get back to the lab after COVID, uh, to remember this concept. And that is, we don't fundamentally know why these drugs work. So I want you to think about a thought experiment for a second. Imagine a cell is, um, is, is a blood cell and it's normally doing its thing and then it acquires BCR able. It now grows more rapidly than all the other cells that it takes over. When you inhibit BCR able, what should happen? It shouldn't die. It should actually just lose its advantage and go back to normal. But that's not what happens. It dies. It somehow becomes addicted to that oncogene. And I would argue that we still don't fundamentally understand why that is. And I think one of the most interesting things in the modern era is that Although we understand a lot about why these mechanism-based cancer drugs work, there's a lot we don't understand. I encourage, I hope that all of you are gonna help us figure out why these cancer drugs work and why they're so effective, and then we can develop even better therapies for a broader spectrum of cancer uh, patients. And so I entered um, the field at that moment, this heady days, the early days, like immuno-oncology is now, that we could develop cancer therapies if we understood the genetics of cancer in a patient, we could discover the mutant gene, understand what it did, develop drugs, and then test them in the lab and bring it back to the patient. And for me, that was really uh, an amazing era. And the other thing that happened when I entered the laboratory as a fellow was the sequencing of the human genome. And this was important because you, you know, all of you live in the era now where the human genome is known. We know all the genes and all the sequence, but we didn't before. So we didn't even know what the genes were to sequence, but we did 15 to 20 years ago for the first time. And that allowed us to begin systematically looking for mutations in cancer genes across human cancers. And so people began to do that. And again, BCR able is a kinase and people started looking at other kinases and we began to identify cancer genes. And many of these are functionally validated. And the idea was simple. 
you have these kinases that activate downstream signaling, just like ABLE does, and they're wild type. But if you get a mutation that changes a single base pair, like this T to C right here, you can take an inactive kinase and now make it stuck or activated in the on um, And we and many others began looking for those mutated oncogenes over and over again. It's been one of the great success stories of cancer medicine of the past 10 or 15 years. And so my first project as a fellow was to study blood cancer similar to CML what we call myeloproliferative neoplasms that Vicky talked about in her introduction. Polycythemia vera, too many red cells, essential thrombocytosis, too many platelets, or myelofibrosis, which is the disease of the bone marrow. And so we began to want to study systematically the genetics of these diseases. So we actually collected samples from around the United States, and we had patients mail us their blood samples. We also had them swab their cheeks so that we had their non-blood DNA. Because what we were looking for were somatic or acquired mutations that were in their blood cells and were not in their um, normal um, cells. And we did uh, sequencing of about 325 patients, 650 sequencing runs, 211,000 total runs. And this took us about a year, and it took us about three quarters of a million dollars. This now would take one person about a week and would cost about, I would say, $10,000. So think about how far we've come in the last 15 years. But what was amazing was that we identified in these chronic blood cancers one mutation in 80% of the patients in one gene called JAK2, just another kinase or Janus, the king of kinases, that mutation substituted one amino acid valine to phenylalanine and the rest of the protein is normal. We know that 95% of PVERA and about half of ET and MF have this specific one mutation. We never see this in normals. And if we put this in cells, they grow just like BCR-ABLE positive cells. And if we put this in mouse models, we recapitulate the phenotype. But I think the most exciting thing for me was the idea that we, we were able to work with pharmaceutical companies, including Insight, to develop small molecule inhibitors of JAK2. Those went into the lab and ultimately we were able to inhibit um, the effects of the mutation, and the drugs were approved in 2011. So six years after we discovered um, the mutations, the drug was approved that has now been available for nine years. So that's a really uh, great example of patients back to the lab, a discovery that then led to a drug, and really, I think the pace of this continues to increase. But it's not so simple. So let me give you an example of a screen that didn't work so well. So in addition to doing screens for chronic blood cancers, we were very interested in screening for mutations um, in acute leukemias because that was really the disease that I um, wanted to study and spend my career on. And so we were looking for other kinase mutations in AML, and we knew that there were mutations in one gene called FLT3, and we knew that a subset of other kinase mutations, but about 40%, we didn't know what the kinase mutation was. So we sequenced every kinase gene and we found nothing except for a few additional mutations in FLT3. And these are the mutations we identified. You can see the list here. And what was interesting to us was that they were throughout the gene. They were all acquired or somatic. And so we said, all right, we didn't find anything in new genes, but at least we found a bunch of new mutations in FLT3. And so these will be pathogenic and maybe we can make drugs against them. But we did something really important before we just went off to the races to test drugs. We actually took every mutation we found in patients and we went back to the lab and we studied it in the lab. And what we found was a really interesting set of results. So in some cases, like these two mutations in R834 and S451, these mutations actually promoted the growth of leukemia cells, as did these two here. But th these five mutations actually had no effect. And in fact, some of the mutations of this gene were activating and some were not. And so what does that mean? That means that some of these are what we call drivers. They're actually the things that the cell acquires and actually promote the growth or advantage of the cancer cell over the normal. Those are the mutations you want to treat. But the others are what we call passengers. These are acquired in cancer cells, and they're just noise. And then that same cell picks up other mutations, but it carries along all the other mutations it picked up in its history. And so even for a known cancer gene, even for acquired mutations, you can't do this without doing the biology. And so I want to leave you with this idea for this part that we have to study each of these mutations one by one. And many of us here at HOP and around the country are systematically taking all this wealth of genomic data and testing it one by one by one. 
So what are the lessons from gene resequencing? We've learned a lot. We found a lot of mutations. We go from individual genes to gene families. This can be used to prioritize studies, but we still have to go back to the lab and do all of the wet lab work. It gets harder the more we sequence. And this doesn't even get in to all of the other mutations we could identify. And I'm not gonna talk about these today. You'll hear about them throughout the next two months. So that was where we were when I started my career as an independent investigator in 2007. What's happened since has been the technology has exploded, just like your computer or your iPhone increases in um, sort of uh, firepower every year. Our ability to sequence genes goes up every year. The cost per base goes down and we can sequence. We went from Sanger to capillary sequencing to capture methods to next generation sequencing. And most sequencing done now is done through next generation sequencing, which works very different than before. So it used to be before we did it in a tube, but now you attach the DNA to this flow cell, which is this glass slide, and then you actually break the DNA in half, and then you sequence by synthesis. You basically match up to the um, unmatched strand, and you basically can do this for billions of spots at a time. And each of them is a couple hundred base pair fragment, and then using computational tricks, you can map it back to the genome. So imagine you basically develop the jigsaw puzzle, where each of those spots is your puzzle, and then you had a computer that could put the puzzle back together. That's how next-gen uh, uh, sequencing works. The other important um, advent was capture-based sequencing. And this was a really nifty trick developed about 10 years ago, where let's say you don't want to sequence all the genome. I only want to sequence the genes I care about. So what you can do is actually develop sequence to the regions you care about and tag it to biotin, grab that sequence out of the genome, and then throw away the rest. It's sort of like a filter. If you say, okay, I want to sequence the genes I care about, and then everything else goes away, and this massively reduces the complexity and cost. It's probably $1,000 to $1,500 per um, sample. And so what did this technology do? It opened us our eyes up to mutations we never knew about. And so I thought I'd give one example of mutations that we never thought we'd see. This was originally done by Bert Vogelstein and colleagues, where initially they sequenced the exome of 22 patients with brain tumors. They identified mutations in a gene called IDH1. IDH1 is isocitrate dehydrogenase. It's in the Krebs cycle, which some of you may have learned about in high school, and I know all of you, if you want to study science, will learn about in college and maybe a medical school or graduate school. It's important in metabolism. No one ever expected IDH mutations in human cancer. They occur in brain tumors, they occur in many other tumors, and the initial study suggested that these mutations resulted in loss of function. The problem with that is that they occurred at very specific spots. About a year later, Elaine Martis, Tim Lay, and colleagues did the first AML genome, a whole genome. They took a patient with AML, they just chopped up all of the DNA, and they sequenced it without any capture of anything. And they identified three known mutations in this patient and seven that they didn't know about. And none of those mutations were um, ever seen again. So we don't know, are those seven other mutations um, real and pathogenic or are they passenger? You have to functionally study them one after the other after the other. So instead, they kept sequencing more and more patient genomes. And they actually resequenced the same AML genome from before with better technology. And they identified an IDH1 mutation and they saw that that was seen in 8% of their additional samples. One of the best ways to predict what mutations matter in cancer is that if you see a mutation in a patient and then you see it in a bunch of other patients, what we call recurrence, you see it over and over and over again. And that really was the first evidence that IDH1 was not only mutated in brain tumors, but in leukemias. And then a really important observation was made. And this was done by a group of investigators at Agios, as well as by Craig Thompson, who's our CEO at Sloan Kettering, and by Luke Cantley, who's um, the Cancer Center Director at Wild Cornell, Matt Vanderheiden, and many others. And that was the following observation. IDH is normally in the Krebs cycle. And what they initially figured out was that it was dead, the mutation. They could not convert isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. The problem is the mutations actually were only at two spots. They weren't nonsense or frame shift or deletions. They substituted two different um, spots for, from arginine for histidine. So the weird thing was, why would it be a loss of function unless you could 
inactivate the gene in many different ways. And what they found was that through metabolite profiling, was that there was an aberrant gain of function and then new metabolite called 2-hydroxyglutarate that was produced. And so what the mutation does is instead of the gene doing its normal function, it now has a gain of a new function. We call that a neomorphic function. And that was the first example of the human cancer of that neomorphic function. So that led to a very interesting experiment we did with Craig Thompson, which was that if this neomorphic ends mutation in AML led to a new metabolite, we could take serum from patients and measure that metabolite. And the prediction would be that every patient that had this aberrant metabolite made by the mutation would match up to the serum levels. The problem was we found all these patients that had high 2-HG levels that did not have the IDH1 mutation. And this led us to identify mutation in IDH2, its parallel. And in fact, both IDH1 and IDH2 are mutated in AML in 15 to 30%. They're mutated in biliary duct cancers. They're mutated in a small spectrum of almost every human cancer brain tumors. And based on this work, we went ahead and did two things. The first thing we did was make animal models. Um, there'll be a whole talk on animal models, but needless to say, we can make mouse models with IDH2 mutations and they get AML. And then we collaborated with Agios to test drugs preclinically and show that they could reduce the growth of leukemic cells and actually promote their differentiation into normal cells. And they went into the clinic. And these drugs had significant activity with about a 25% complete response rate and a 50% overall response rate. These are not curative. I would argue that for most human cancers, no one targeted therapy is going to be curative, but like hepatitis C or HIV, if we could piece together a set of targeted therapies that target different mutations, we hopefully can develop a cocktail of therapies that work for human cancer. So what are the lessons from gene discovery? It's easy to generate data, but it's harder to analyze it. The best way to predict what mutations matter is their recurrence, but we need to spend, do the hard work and study this functionally. But the last thing, and I'm gonna end with this part before I answer your questions, is what we care about most, first and foremost are, what are the mutations that we see in patients that change our clinical care? We want to find new therapeutic targets that actually let us find new drugs. But even if we don't have new therapeutic targets, if they predict who does better versus worse with existing therapies or who we should treat, we can use that data um, clinically. And so how is genome sequencing impacting ca cancer care? We can use it to find new targets. We can use it to predict who's going to do well, who's going to do bad. And we can even use it to predict who responds to chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. And I believe that this is, has tremendous uh, impact in the clinic. And so I thought I'd end with coming back to leukemia and giving you an example of how we can use um, molecular profiling, even without a new drug, to decide what to do for patients. And so one thing we did a number of years ago was take 502 leukemia patients and sequence all of the known leukemia genes and see if we could predict outcome based on um, AML. We identified all of these different mutations at frequency. This Excel spreadsheet shows all of the pairwise mutations we saw. So not only did we see mutations, we saw combinations. But more importantly, this surplus plot shows not only do we see different mutations, but we see common co-occurring mutations like DNMT3A, MPM1, MPM1, IDH2. So we don't want to study what a genes do. We want to study what permutations of genes do, cocktails of genes. And that's shown here that what we did was develop a prognostic schema that allowed us to take a set of mutations and predict outcome. And this let us develop new prognostic schema for AML. And we basically were able to take all of the patients on green who based on this now more complicated molecular profile, they go from having a 50% survival to a 90% survival. So we tell these patients, we don't need to give you a bone marrow transplant. We can actually de-escalate your therapy. Your chance of doing well is high. These patients in red, who normally would have been on this curve, actually have a worse outcome. And so these patients need clinical trials, bone marrow transplant. So it changes the care for these patients. The problem here, though, is that this data was generated on the patients where we developed the prognostic schema. You can't change care if the only patients you've tested your predictor on are the ones where the predictor was developed. 
So we took a second set of patients and we redid the predictor and it predicted as well. This is really important in using biomarkers. You need to not only develop predictors, but you gotta go out and test them over and over again. The same thing's true for COVID-19. If you wanna think, for example, that a particular biomarker predicts for bad outcome in COVID-19 that's low Kettering, you gotta go somewhere else and test the second cohort. Because ultimately, if you're gonna change clinical care, it's gotta be reproducible and robust. But I think the best news about our results are that they're totally outdated. And so within five years, uh, it became totally obsolete. Ellie Pap Emanuel and colleagues developed much more sophisticated uh, treatment algorithms where they looked at 110 genes and developed even better algorithms. And the good news is that these algorithms no longer require you to memorize them. And in fact, when we say AML patients now, we take all of the genomic data there are clinical data. We plug it into websites like this, and we can actually predict for every patient based on their genetics and clinical parameters what their likelihood of doing well versus not. And so you no longer need to say, oh, this mutation's the good one, that one's the bad one. You take the whole risk profile with the patient, molecular, clinical, everything else, and we can predict their outcome. This is what we believe is the future of oncology more broadly, is that we're going to use this genetic data combined with everything else we know about the patient to predict outcome. And we think this is going to be true for almost all human diseases, that this will be, you know, people talk about something called poly polygenic risk scores, the idea that we can do this for lots of different human diseases. And we're really excited at Sloan Kettering because thanks to MSK Impact, we're able to offer uh, genomic profiling to now over 50,000 uh, patients, including both solid tumor and liquid tumor patients. And this really for us is, we believe, the future, which is here and today, that we need to do genomic profiling in every cancer patient we can because we believe we can learn, we can use our existing therapies, and we can predict and develop new therapies based on that genomic information. So what are the implications of genomic studies? After genome studies, we need to go on and do much larger studies of bigger data sets. We need to do phase three trials and figure out if specific therapies match up to specific genotypes. We need to do large data sets and figure out what they mean. And implementing this in the clinic is a critical aspect. It's not easy to develop sequencing pipelines in the clinic as part of care. And the last part for those of you that love to use computers, our ability to analyze, interpret, and translate these data to patients is a major ongoing challenge. I would encourage each and every one of you to learn to code. It's the thing you need to do, even if you're going to be a scientist in the lab, if you're going to be a clinician, if you can analyze large data sets as part of your skill set, it's going to empower you. So please listen to your um, uh, teachers and your role models who tell you to learn computational analysis. So there's so much more to cover, but you know, it can't all be covered in the first lecture. Cancer in the immune system, how to develop and test new cancer therapies, the use of animal models to study biology and therapeutic, the role of computational analysis, artificial intelligence, novel analytics. How do you combine all of that with an interest in caring for cancer patients? I believe that this is the best time ever to be a physician scientist to combine science and medicine. And we at Sloan Kettering and around the world are here to help to provide information to advise support you. You're the future of the field, and we could not be more excited to um, be here for you and to see you all uh, take it to the next level. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And if we have time, Vicki, I'll be uh, thrilled uh, to take uh, questions. Great. Thanks so much, um, Dr. We actually have 30 questions. Um, I'll try to address um, couple of them in the top, in the middle, and those that were recently submitted. Um, actually, the first one, they ask, what is your email address? Are you willing to It's uh, Levine R at mskcc.org. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. And um, you did mention this earlier, but someone asked about the slides. They will be available afterwards. Yeah. Okay, Absolutely. Great. So the first is, how have the new gene editing technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 impacted cancer research? Well, CRISPR-Cas9 is a really exciting technology, and it's almost a lecture in its own right. But the idea that we can do gene editing has been tremendously empowering as a scientific tool. It lets us do things in the lab that would have taken years can take uh, weeks. Um, the question I think we're excited now is, are the therapeutic potential for CRISPR. The idea that we might be able to revert no, mutant genes to normal genes, right now it's still, you know, in very early laboratory tests, but the possibility is there. It's almost like having a copy and paste function, and so it changes so many things we can do. Okay, 
Okay, great. And the next question is, what drugs are used in chemotherapy and how do they work? Um, they said, I've heard cancer cells becoming resistant to chemo drugs. How is this possible and how do you test which cells are cancerous? Well, so we think of all cancer therapies as having different mechanisms of action. Classical chemotherapy, which is still the mainstay of leukemia, which I treat, kills dividing cells and leukemic cells more than normal cells, but is not targeting genetic events in the, in the leukemia or the cancer. So they tend to be more toxic and have less of a um, uh, therapeutic index or benefit to risk, but they can work. It's just that it's harder for the patient. And so we're very excited about now moving from chemotherapy to targeted and immune therapy, which have higher efficacy and lower toxicity. But there's still going to be a role for chemotherapy and radiation and surgery. And there are some circumstances like testicular cancer and Hodgkin's where chemotherapy is so effective that nearly everyone's cured, fortunately, just using uh, age-old chemotherapy, which has been around for 40 or 50 years. Okay. Great. And um, this question is actually useful, I believe, for most of our audience. What resources do you recommend high school schoolers look into for learning more about cancer? Well, I think there's a lot of good um, online links. And I think maybe, Vicki, something that you and I can do is we can put together some lists and put them on the website. I think yeah. some really um, great books. Bob Weinberg's put some great books about cancer. I think if you want to read about Cancer is a Historical Disease, The Emperor of All Maladies by Sid Mukherjee is a great story of the history of uh, the fight against cancer. It's a little bit more of a history. I think if you could marry that with more some fundamental science, it's, it'd be great. So we'll try and put together some uh, reading yeah. terms because I know that I talk fast and I cover a lot of ground. <laughs> you, you, the, we want you all to, to build on that and deep dive. And I'm still reading and learning too. Absolutely. Um, Esther asks, what skills do you think are most important to be successful in a research lab? Well, I think curiosity and persistence are the two most important skills. I think always asking questions and always um, looking at results and asking why and what and how it happened and then being persistent and doing it. And the thing I always try to explain to folks is that done right, every experiment, even if the results are negative, is informative. And so it's critical to design your experiments that you know you have your you know your answer that you're hoping for, but even if you don't get that answer, you learn things. And so designing your experiments right, and if you learn how to think and design science um, at an early age, design experiments, it will carry you for the rest of your life. And it's something that we continue to work and get better at. But it's the thing I encourage high schoolers to do is to ask. Why was the experiment done that way? How did I, how do you design that? And the more you take ownership of that, the better. Great. Um, another question we had is, what is GI obstruction? So imagine that your gastrointestinal tract, your stomach, your intestines, your esophagus, is a tube where food is swallowed, absorbed, and digested. And imagine if a cancer is next to that tube, and now it blocks it, and it kinks it, and it blocks it. It's imagine like, it's like stepping on a um, garden hose. And so cancer sometimes can do that, and then all of a sudden you can't normally have the GI system function because it's been externally blocked. And so you have to either remove or treat that cancer to open back up the GI tract. Okay, great. Um, another question is, can I become a cancer researcher without a medical degree? What degree do you need? You can become a cancer researcher with or without a medical degree. Um, obviously, I made the decision because when I was in um, college, I thought I wanted to be a physician and my love of science came later and I'm very glad I do both. But I have colleagues in my laboratory that have PhDs and masters we think there's a role for many people with many different educational backgrounds and stories from PhDs and MDs and masters and nursing degrees and pharmacy degrees. We have room for everybody. It's a big tent. We just want people to continue to enhance their experience and apply it to the cancer question. Okay, great. And the next question is, what is the difference between IDH and IDH2? So there are three genes in the human um, genome called, that are called IDH, IDH1, 2, and 3, they all have the same function, but they're different genes. And that's actually true of a lot of different things in our body. There's redundancy, and that's so that if one gene gets um, altered and lost, um, the others can step in, or they have different functions, different parts of the cell. It turns out in leukemia or in other cancers, you can mutate IDH1 or IDH2, and then those have an aberrant gain of function, but the other two IDHs 
one in three of two have mutated remains normal. And so you don't need to mutate all three, you just need to mutate one. So that has this aberrant gain of function. Great, and we've gotten a couple of questions in reference to your comp computational comment. Um, they ask, what coding languages would you suggest um, they learn? Yeah, I mean, the answer is that, you know, you want to start simple and even starting with scratch is great. And I can't code, so I'm the wrong person to address that. But I would say that most people these days are coding in R or Python. But honestly, learning um, any language is a start because it's usually what the learning the second one is a lot easier than the first. And again, maybe okay. we can, we'll post, and I encourage people to go to Code Academy. And maybe, Vicki, if you remind me, we can post some resources that my lab's put together on some online things that we've encouraged people to coding, and we'd love to share that with folks, if that's of value. Okay, yes, that's great. Um, and Sawa asks, so oncogenes and tumor suppressors are genes that are only drivers or blockers of cancer if they are mutated? So oncogenes are genes where they have a gain of function, either increased normal, fu the function normal is increased, like the gas pedals down, or a brand new function. Tumor suppressors are something where the function is disabled. Of course, cancer doesn't read the book, and there's lots of examples of genes that can be a little bit of both or something in between. Um, so I don't want you to take my classification as I'm hard and fast. Okay, great. So this question was, are blood tumors and liquid tumors the same? What does that mean regarding the spread of cancers? Yeah, it's a great question. So we tend to think of tumors of the hematopoietic or blood, bone marrow, and lymph nodes. We call them blood tumors, liquid tumors, heme malignancies. They're all the same thing. And those, because they're in a um, sort of organ system that's throughout your body, your bone marrow, your lymph nodes, your blood, those inherently are not usually localized. Whereas solid tumors, if you're in the colon or lung or breast, those start localized and then spread. And those have big implications because for a solid tumor, a tumor of, a, of an organ that's not blood, that spread is an important predictor of who's gonna do more poorly and who we need to treat more aggressively. Whereas the liquid tumors, it's less predictive because they can all spread from the beginning. Okay, great. And the next question is, how does your research in molecular target discovery relate to overarching genes throughout different cancers such as oncogenic MYC. Say that again, Vicki. How does your research in molecular target discovery relate to overarching genes throughout different cancers, such as oncogenic MYC? Uh, well, so the way I approach this is that my lab studies the genes that are altered in the cancers that um, I take care of and the other doctors in my lab take care of, and we study leukemias. And so the genes that we study are relevant to leukemia. Many times those same genes are broad and overarching, and MYC is one of those genes that can be relevant. But we focus on some genes, and the lab next to us focuses on others. And the hope is that the whole community and all of you will study all of the important genes. And some of them may have impact on a cancer you yourself aren't studying, but may affect somebody else's science. And that's the beauty of the feed forward loop of uh, academic discovery. Great. The next question, how has the current situation of COVID-19 impacted cancer research? It must be harder to access labs and collaborate with others. Well, it has been harder. I think it was really hard in March and April and May, um, especially a lot of the labs here. Most of the labs were shut down, like most everywhere. And we've slowly been getting back to work, which is encouraging. And everyone's excited to be back at work. But it's not the same. You know, we're not interacting personally with other labs. We don't have all of you in our labs. You know, we really love uh, the vibrant atmosphere of having younger students in the labs. And so it's not the same. And there definitely are consequences to the discoveries, the training. And the quicker we all can listen to the doctors and experts and socially distance and we can get back to doing science and care, the better, um, better off discovery will be. But we're doing the best we can, even uh, though we're somewhat limited. Okay, great. Does the success of chemotherapy depend on the patient? Say that again? Does the success of chemotherapy depend on the patient? Absolutely. And I think we don't understand a lot of how two patients that get the same chemotherapy, why one responds and not, other than the genetic alterations. They have to be things that that patient has in their inherited genetics, their life, their other diseases. And that's a lot of what we're trying to study more and more. The immune system that cleans up after treatment, so much to figure out. 
Okay, so this is a, quite a broad question. So what do you see as the biggest challenge to oncology and how do you think it can be overcome? Well, I think the biggest challenge is that cancer is a very complex, rapidly evolving system. And so we don't not need only to understand what are the genetic events that occur, but what are the driving factors that allow certain events to be advantage of others? What's that Darwinian process? And the more we can understand how cancer thinks or evolves and what might be doing, and we can develop you know, biological um, tools and treatments to intercept that process, the more likely we are. But that's much easier said than done. It requires a lot of data and a lot of modeling. Okay, great. And this will be our last question. And as a reminder, we will copy the questions that were submitted and Dr. Levine will answer them on Twitter. And his Twitter handle is Ross Levine MD, correct? Yep. Okay, great. So this last question is why should we care about the tumor's microenvironment? Well, my whole lecture today was about cancer cells and their genes. And that I think is just one part of it. We have to think of cancer as an ecosystem where it's evolving and changing in a rapidly changing environment. Imagine that a uh, person in a desert has different uh, requirements than in a rainforest. And we have to think of cancer that way and how cancer might ultimately um, take advantage of one versus the other. And so we think the microenvironment's exciting and important and it's its own lecture. So that's for another time. Okay, great. Um, again, I'd like to thank Dr. Levine, and I'd thank like to thank all thank of you, you as well that have attended our um, first seminar series. We look forward to seeing you again. Um, our next one will be with Dr. Kai on the 9th. And again, thank you all and all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you.